Bishop Robert Nava. hour flight, but I tell you, this place has kind of lifted my spirits, hearing that wonderful singing and praise. Terrific. Terrific. And also, I'll tell you the truth, I'm not sure why you're having me here to talk about new evangelization, because, you know, in my experience, I mean this very sincerely, the Filipino church, I think, is where it's happening today. I think this is the most vibrant church in the world. It is. You know, in both um, Chicago, where I'm from, and now LA, where I'm serving as auxiliary bishop, it's the Filipinos who are keeping the church alive. You know, I mean, many, it's true, many parishes are, are fading away in some of the mainstream communities, and then the Filipinos come and lift up the church. And I, I think, you know, in God's providence, different churches play this role at different times. Think of, you know, my mother church, the Church of Ireland, at one time was sending missionaries all over the world. The faith was so vibrant, so alive in Ireland, it, it became diffusive of itself. It sent itself around the world. And look now, the Irish church is struggling in so many ways. But I think in God's providence, right now it's the Filipino church that has this role of missionary to the world. You know, some of you saw the Catholicism series that uh, we produced, and we filmed all over the world. And wherever you'd go, we always filmed the Mass, because we had a whole episode on the Mass. Wherever we went around the world, you'd always see Filipinos filling up the view. So I, I really believe that in God's providence. This church is playing a very important role. Another reason it's so important is um, we could have the next Pope as the Archbishop of uh, Manila. Huh? I'll be very nice to Cardinal Tagway when I'm in Cebu with him. <laughs> He's a great man, a great churchman, and someone that has also lifted up the faith of people around the world. So I'm very eager to see him, uh, I hope, tomorrow. I met him for the first time in uh, Washington last uh, September for the uh, Pope's visit. And, uh, you know, like everybody else, I was charmed by him, lifted up by him, inspired by him. So I will, I promise, be nice to him tomorrow. Hey, listen, I'm here to talk to you, as I mentioned, about the new evangelization. The last four popes have stressed the centrality of it. And again, speaking to you, to this Church of, of Manila, the Church of the Philippines, where I think you are on the cutting edge of the new evangelization. What I want to do is simply share with you seven recommendations, and don't worry, they won't, they won't be too long, but seven recommendations for all of us involved in this work of bringing Christ in a fresh way to a world that's grown tired, a world that's grown spiritually uh, lacking in alertness. So let me share these with you now. Seven recommendations born not only of my you know, reading and teaching, but of a lot of practical experience. So for the past about 10 years, our Word on Fire uh, work has been engaged directly in new evangelization. And what's working, what isn't working, what appeals to people, I think I know a little bit from very direct experience about that. So that's what I wanna share with you. Here's recommendation number one for the new evangelization. Lead with the beautiful. Lead with the beauty of the Catholic faith. Remember in Pope Francis' great uh, uh, statement on uh, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, he says, try the via pulchritudinis, Latin for the way of beauty. Now here's what I mean. Philosophers out here would remember what they call the three transcendentals. 
That means wherever you find something real, you're going to find the true, the good, and the beautiful. Well, can I suggest today, in our postmodern culture, it's difficult to begin with the true or the good. How come? Well, because people are skeptical. They say, who are you to tell me what to believe? Or worse, who are you to tell me how to live? You begin with the truth, what do people say today? Well, they'll say, yeah, that's your truth, but who are you to impose it on me? Or, yeah, that's good for you, but, but don't impose it on me. Beginning with the true and the good can be non-starters. So I would suggest begin with the third transcendental, the beautiful. In fact, that, that was behind my Catholicism series very much, that we focused on the beautiful. Just look at Chartres Cathedral. I'm not going to tell you what to think or how to behave yet, but begin with just the beauty of Chartres. Look at that. Begin with the beauty of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. I'm not telling you what to think or how to behave. Just look at it. Or just look at the lives and the work of Mother Teresa's sisters in Calcutta, which I was privileged to see firsthand. The wager is that the beautiful is less threatening. It's a more winsome approach. But the beautiful will lead you to the true and the good. You know why? Because people will see the beauty of Sharp Cathedral and they'll say, who, who were these people that built it? What inspired them? Where did that come from? The beautiful leads to the true and the good. Or look at Mother Teresa's sisters. And, and once you take in the beauty of it, you're going to say, well, what made that possible? What are their beliefs? What's the good that has so grasped their heart that they're willing to live this way? Begin, everybody, with the beauty of the Catholic faith. Now, we'll get to the true and the good. We'll reach the point where you say, now here's how you should live. But start with the beauty. Do you play baseball here in Manila? It's a baseball thing? That, of course, was the game when I was a kid. Uh, that was the game. And I remember, to this day, vividly, my dad taking me and my brother to a Detroit Tigers baseball game. And I remember it, it, it's vivid in my mind as we came up out of the you know, kind of bowels of the stadium and suddenly you're in the bright light, it was a night game, and I can still see the, the green of the field and the, and the white of the players' uniforms. And I took in with my seven-year-old eyes the beauty of these professional players playing. Well, you know what that did is immediately it led me to say to my father, I, I, I want to play. I, I, I want to play. And then, then, once I had played the game for many years, I began to understand its rules, its regulations, but from the inside. See, I mean, they, they weren't imposed upon me. I appreciated them once I had played the game. Can I suggest it's similar in religion? It's first the beauty of Catholicism that draws us in. And then that beauty leads me to say, I want to play that game. I want to be part of that world. And then, listen, once I'm in that world, I understand its rules. I understand its regulations. I understand its yeses and noes. But now from the inside. So, First recommendation, via pulchritudinus, walk the way of beauty. Okay, recommendation number two. Don't dumb down the message. Don't dumb down Catholicism. You know, I came of age right after Vatican II. I went to first grade in 1965, 
Now you know how old I am. Um, Vatican II, everybody, was the fruit of the cream of the crop of Catholic intelligentsia in the mid 20th century. Think for a second of the great figures at Vatican II. Karl Rahner, Josef Ratzinger, Hans Urs von Balthasar, Henri de Lubach, Jean Danielu, Yves Congar, the list goes on and on. The people that gave us Vatican II were some of the smartest people in the Catholic world in the mid 20th century. Furthermore, read the council documents. The intelligence of these people comes surging through these documents. But then something happened, at least in America, I'm guessing too here. Somehow all of that rich intelligence got dumbed down. When I was going through school in those years after the council, I got a dose of what I call banners and balloons Catholicism. You know what I mean? Kind of a happy, clappy, not very intelligent, uh, superficial presentation of the Catholic faith. This dumbed down Catholicism was a pastoral disaster. Why do I say it? Because so many people in my generation once they grew up, realized this childish, superficial religion was not feeding them, was not responding to the deepest longings of their hearts. And they left. They left in droves. John Henry Newman says that one of the signs of a vibrant Catholicism is that it thinks seriously about the faith. When you stop thinking about the faith, it loses vibrancy and persuasive power. Here's a story I've told a couple times, maybe you've run across it on the YouTube. My niece, this is about, oh, six, seven years ago now. She was a senior going into her senior year in a very good Catholic high school outside Chicago. My brother proudly said to me, oh, take a look at her books. And all her books were on the dining room table. Her books for the coming school year. On top of the pile was Hamlet. Shakespeare's Hamlet. And not Hamlet for dummies, not, not a, a, a flattened out version, the whole text of Hamlet. Underneath that was Virgil's Aeneid. So the most complicated poem ever written in Latin, she was studying Latin. That was her textbook. Underneath that was a Einsteinian physics text, bristling with complex equations. Under that was a big paper bag with large print, lots of pictures, and that was her religion book. So I said to my brother, does this bug you? He said, what, you what would bug me about it? I said, she's reading Shakespeare for English. She's reading Virgil's Aeneid for Latin. She's reading Einstein in science. And she's reading a comic book for religion. So you know what I did? It was near her birthday. I went out and I bought her volume one of Aquinas' Summa Contra Gentiles. I bought her Augustine's Confessions. I bought her Dante's Divine Comedy and Chesterton's Orthodoxy. And I presented her with these books, and I said, these are the Catholic versions of the other books you're reading. See, but friends, here's what bugs me. No, nobody came in and did this to us. We did it to ourselves. We dumbed down our own richly intelligent faith, and that has been a pastoral disaster. Reclaim it. Reclaim it. You know, in, the, in my Catholicism series, my first recommendation is on display. Lead with the beautiful. But also, I hope, the second recommendation is on display. I wanted that series to be beautiful, and I wanted it to be smart. 
because Catholicism is both those things. When we stop thinking about the faith, it loses its compelling evangelical power. So don't dumb it down. That's recommendation two. Here's number three. Preach the faith with ardor. Preach the faith with ardor. Fire. That's where the title of my ministry comes from, Word on Fire. Jesus said, I've come to light a fire on the earth. Right, right. From the beginning, the most persuasive evangelical preachers were fiery. Remember in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear that when the, the first apostles preached, people were cut to the heart. Now that's good Christian preaching. That's preaching with evangelical power. You know, long ago, even before Christ and the Apostles, the great Greek philosopher Aristotle said, finally people only listen to an excited speaker. It's true, isn't it? You might be saying the best things in the world. You might be as right as rain. But if you can't muster some fire for what you're saying, people will not listen. I'm not sure what... Um, commercials are like over here in Manila or in the Philippines, but, you know, back home you, you'll be watching TV and on comes a commercial, and here's somebody and he's advertising some new you know, exercise machine and he's as fiery as any evangelical preacher. Well, heck, if we can, we can muster fire for an exercise machine, can't we muster some ardor and fire for the eternally powerful Word of God? Finally, people only listen to an excited speaker. Speak to people about Jesus Christ in a way that reflects the difference he's made in your life. Proclaim Jesus Christ as someone with whom you've fallen in love. So it's not just a set of ideas. Then you'll preach with fire. And then your preaching and speaking will have transformative power. Now, let me mention Vatican II again here. There's ardor all through the documents of Vatican II. Take a look at those great statements, and they're full of an evangelical fire. But somehow, after Vatican II, the church wasn't marked by a missionary fervor. It was marked, I think, by a kind of hand-wringing self-questioning, self-doubting attitude. Well, that might work in the classroom. You know, if you're in graduate school and you're musing over questions and you're raising doubts, fine, it has a certain role to play. But it will not be evangelically convincing. People are not persuaded by question marks. They're persuaded by exclamation points. Ardor fire. You know, you see it all over the culture in the West, I think. What Pope Benedict called the dictatorship of relativism, remember that lovely phrase? That means, you know, I got my truth, you got your truth. Yeah, that's true for me, it's good for me, but you know, not good for you. There's no truth or goodness, there's just my truth or my goodness. You know what that leads to, the dictatorship of relativism? It leads to what I call the eh, culture. Eh, eh, it's good for you, not for me. I'll, I'll tolerate you, you tolerate me. Do you ever see, I don't know if they do it over here, but the kids in America will do whatever. You ever see that? Whatever. You should believe this. Whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that makes you happy, but, you know, don't impose it on me. John Henry Newman said, What gives a river its energy is the firmness of its banks. Does that make sense? If the banks are firm, then the water is going to flow with energy, with purpose. What if you knock down the banks of a river? Oh, let the river go free. Knock down the banks. 
what's going to happen is that energetic river is going to open up into a big lazy lake that's a lot of our culture i think is in the name of freedom we've knocked down so many of the absolutes we've disregarded the truth and the good and what's happened is the energy of our culture has dissipated and it's opened up into this big lazy lake and all of us are resting on our individual air mattresses tolerating each other but we don't know where we're going we don't know what our purpose is remember right after the Annunciation it says that Mary got up and she went in haste. That's right. When you know what the truth is, not just my truth, your truth. When you know what your life is about, you move. You move in haste. Good evangelical preaching is opposed to the huh, culture. It's full of ardor. It's full of fire. That's what our preaching has to be like. Fourth recommendation, tell the great story. Tell the great story. What is evangelization? Well, it's the announcement, isn't it, of the euangelion. That means the good news, the glad tidings. What's the good news? The good news is, that the story of Israel has come to its climax. If you don't know the story of Israel, everybody, you will not appreciate Jesus as the climax of that story. And then what happens is Jesus turns into one more ethical teacher. He turns into a guru, someone with deep spiritual insights poet, a mystic. I mean, and all that is true to a degree. I mean, you could say, sure, all those things describe Jesus. But see, none of that is evangelical. The euangelion is that the story of Israel has come to its fulfillment. So what's the story of Israel? Think of it as a kind of five-act drama. Act one, creation. This world is not just dumbly there, it's been brought into being with intelligent purpose. God's great gift to us. Act two of the great drama, the great story, is the fall. Through our sin, creation has been compromised. Through our sin, our freedom and integrity have been compromised. But God never abandoned his creation. Rather, God endeavored to save it. How? How? Through the formation of a people, a people Israel, who would think as he thinks, who would will and desire as he wills and desires, a people who learned how to worship him aright. What's Israel's purpose? It's to be such a magnet to the other nations that they are all drawn back online. That they too become proper worshipers of God. That they too begin to think as God thinks, to will as he wills. Israel has a fundamentally missionary purpose. Remember we hear in Isaiah, Mount Zion, true pole of the earth, there all the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. That means a gathered Israel becomes the magnetic point which then gathers in the nations of the world. This is why God gave Israel prophets, patriarchs, the temple, the Torah, the law. All those things were meant to bring divinity and humanity together. But does Israel realize its mission? No. The 
prophets summon it back, but people don't listen. The Torah is announced again and again, but people don't follow it. The temple is there to effect a reconciliation, but people fail to worship God aright. And so Israel begins to dream of a Mashiach, an anointed one, who would sum up and fulfill the purpose of Israel. What's act four of the great drama? The Mashiach has come. Now, now everybody, read the Gospels. What do you find the Gospel writers telling us? The Mashiach has come. The Mashiach has come. This long-awaited Savior has come. He's the fulfillment of all the prophets. He himself sums up and fulfills the temple. He himself is the Torah made flesh. And the claim of this Mashiach has been ratified through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now we understand the grab you by the lapels quality of the New Testament. You see what I mean? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the Epistle of Paul. These are not the reflections of people that are sharing some new, interesting, spiritual insight. No, 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 no. These are people that want to grab you by the lapels and tell you news, good news, euangelion, that the Mashiach of Israel has come. Precisely why, everybody, precisely why St. Paul goes careering around the whole world that he knew, frantically telling everyone he could that the Mashiach of Israel has come. And therefore, all the nations are gathered under his headship. All the nations show up on Mount Zion. How wonderful, by the way, everybody, how wonderful. As I, a Chicagoan, now Auxiliary Bishop of Los Angeles, have come here to Manila in the Philippines. And what are we all obsessed with? The God of Israel. The God of Israel. Why are we here in this room right now, today? Because people like Paul and the first evangelist announced the Mashiach has come. Only when you get the great story, when you understand the great story, will you see Jesus as its fulfillment. And therefore, as the Lord drawing all of us under his lordship. See, now we're evangelizing and not just talking about Jesus. You know, by the way, with this point in mind, remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus? They knew all about Jesus, didn't they? You know, what, what thing? What are you talking about? Oh, about Jesus, who was a mighty prophet and beloved by the people, but the elders put him to death. And, and there's even a story he's been raised from the dead. They got the details right, didn't they? They got the data right. But they didn't get it. Why? Why? Well, watch what Jesus does. He walks with them and tells them again the great story and how this Jesus is the fulfillment of it. Then what happened? Then their hearts caught fire. That's evangelization. So tell the great story. Number five, I'll put it now in technical language. Relearn Irenaeus's doctrine of God. Relearn Irenaeus's doctrine of God. Now, who is Saint Irenaeus? He's one of my theological heroes. Wrote in the second century, very early figure. He was taught by Polycarp, Saint Polycarp, who in turn had been taught by John the Apostle. So Irenaeus is very close to biblical times. 
Well, what's his doctrine of God? I'll put it in his famous one-liner. Irenaeus said, Gloria Dei, homo vivens. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. Beautiful. I said, you could lose all of Christian literature and keep that one line, and in many ways you would have kept the whole story. The glory of God, everybody, is a human being fully alive. God is not in competition with us. No, no, his glory, his glory is when we flourish. Now, you think, I'm just whistling Dixie here, there are a lot of philosophies, both ancient and modern, that say just the opposite. God's in competition with us. God is glorified when we are put down. Read, for example, the myth of Prometheus from the ancient world. You'll see it. And then, then, see it roaring up again in the work of the great atheists. Both the old atheists and the so-called new atheists that we hear of today. The founder of modern atheism was a fellow called Ludwig Feuerbach. Feuerbach said, the no to God is the yes to man. He felt that belief in God was denigrating to us. It was alienating. It was dehumanizing. Feuerbach was echoed by Sigmund Freud, who said religions like a infantile fantasy, like a dream. Jean-Paul Sartre, the founder of existentialism, followed the same line. Sartre said, if God exists, I can't be free. But I am free. Therefore, God does not exist. You see, what Sartre's assuming is that my freedom is in competition with God's freedom. But our great theological tradition, beginning with Irenaeus, coming up through Augustine and through Thomas Aquinas into modern times, says just the opposite. The more we surrender to the true God, the more alive we become. The more our humanity is realized. How come? Well, because the glory of God is a human being fully alive. In fact, Christianity, properly understood, is the greatest humanism imaginable. Here's something else that the Church Fathers said. Deus fit homo, ut homo fieret Deus. That means God became man, that man might become God. You see what they meant, not that, that we turn into God, but God became one of us so that we might become sharers in God's own life. See, Christianity is not just, you know, becoming a better person, being more morally upright. It is that, I hope. But it's so much more. Christianity means we've been drawn into the dynamics of God's own life. See, and therefore, no humanism, ancient or modern, is as great as Christian humanism. We've been called to share in God's own life. Let me make a little contrast here. Go back to ancient mythology, Greek and Roman mythology. When the gods break into human affairs, what happens? Well, people are incinerated. People are destroyed. See, as, as the gods come in, we have to give way. Now, contrast that to that wonderful scene in the book of Exodus. Moses sees a bush on fire, but not consumed. The bush is on fire, but not destroyed. What's the point? When the true God comes close, we are rendered beautiful and radiant 
and we are not destroyed. Think of the image of the burning bush. It means when the true God comes close to his creation, his creation is radiant and beautiful and not destroyed. Can I suggest, in conversation with the new atheist today, it's the same old problem. We need to announce authentic Christian humanism, which is grounded in a true vision of God. So, St. Irenaeus, that's suggestion number five. Here's number six. When you evangelize, stress Augustine's anthropology. So Irenaeus' theology of God, and now Augustine's theology of the human person. Page one of Augustine's Confessions, that book I gave to my niece several years ago, page one, has the best line in, in the whole history of Christian anthropology. And here's the line. Lord, you have made us for yourself, and therefore our heart is restless until it rests in thee. We all know that line. But there's no better statement of Christian anthropology. Lord, you made us for yourself. What's the purpose of our life? Well, to be united to God. And that's why our heart is restless until it rests in thee. You know, the, the great American uh, evangelical preacher, Billy Graham, assumed this in every sermon he preached. If you look at, at old tapes of Billy Graham, his sermon always took this form. Everyone wants to be happy, right? And you've tried this, 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 and that, and they haven't made you happy, have they? Well, I've got what makes you happy. That's it. That's evangelical preaching. The heart is restless until it rests in God. You know that great scene in the first book of Kings? The prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel. Mano a mano with the priests of Baal. Remember that story? Is, is 400 priests of, of these false gods. Elijah's the one prophet of Yahweh. And he challenges them. Let's all go up to Mount Carmel. You build altars, call upon your gods. I'll build an altar to my God, and we'll see who answers. Remember? And so the priests of Baal build these altars, and they spend the whole day begging and praying and hopping around the altars, calling upon their God. Elijah wonderfully mocks them. Remember? Where are they? Oh, they're gods. Maybe they're on vacation. Maybe they're taking a nap. In fact, some of my friends who are specialists in Hebrew say that one of the implications of the Hebrew is maybe they're in the bathroom. I don't know where they are. They get so desperate, we hear, that they begin to slash themselves until the blood flows. And still no answer, no response. And then Elijah calls upon the true God. And the fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice. Elijah wins. But see, there's so much more here than just, oh, my God's bigger than your God. It's stressing the point that Augustine stressed. Think of those altars erected to the, to the Baals as all the ways fellow sinners all the ways that we seek satisfaction in something other than God. We seek it in wealth, don't we? If I just get enough wealth, I'll be happy. We seek it in pleasure. Just enough sensual bodily pleasure, I'll be happy. We seek it in power. Think of Tolkien and the ring of power. How seductive it is. We seek it in honor. Oh, if I just get enough titles, they just, they respect me enough, then I'll be happy. But see, none of those things is God. All those things are good, nothing wrong with them in themselves, but none of them is God. 
And therefore, try as we might, we will not find satisfaction in them. And then you know what happens? Anyone that's ever wrestled with an addiction knows what I'm talking about. When this particular good doesn't satisfy me, I get a little panicked and I seek more of it. And then when that doesn't satisfy me, I seek more and more and more, trying to fill up the infinite hunger with something finite. And again, addicts know what I'm talking about. At the end of the day, like the priests of Baal, we begin to harm ourselves in this desperate attempt to find satisfaction. Wealth, pleasure, honor, power, none of them satisfies the heart. All of them lead finally to self-destructive addiction. Then Elijah stands for the orientation of the heart to the one thing that can satisfy him, to the Lord God. That's how we should read God answering with fire. It's only God that can satisfy this fiery longing of the heart. This principle, everybody, I invoke almost every day in my evangelical work. Oh, the most ferocious atheists attacking religion. I'll remind them of this. Isn't there a longing in you that nothing in the world will meet? Admit it, admit it. And that's the beginning of an evangelical transformation. Okay, just one more. Just one more. And it's the use of the new media. Now, I hope you see something. Is um, People associate me now with the new media because of Word on Fire. Notice, please, that I've got seven recommendations. It's the last one. And I've spent six other ones talking about Bible and theology and spirituality. Students of mine have come to me and said, oh, I, I really want to get involved in, in the new media. What should I do? And I always say, spend a lot of time with the old media first. Open up books. So that you have something to say when you use the new media. You know, John Paul said the new evangelization is new in ardor. I talked about that. It's new in expression. And finally he said it's new in method. We are living in a time that I think is comparable only to the time of Gutenberg and the printing press in terms of a revolution in communication technology. Think of how the printing press changed the whole world. I think we're going through a similar time now with the new media, don't you? How we can unite the world how we can inform the whole world. Our capacity to reach out across the oceans, around the world, like that. It would be ludicrous for Christians not to use this extraordinary new uh, medium. But you know, again, uh, I, I sort of smile, it's ironic to me, when I think I'm associated with this. I learned how to type in 1976 on a manual typewriter. Now, does anyone in the room remember typing? <laughs> or a manual typewriter? That's how I learned how to type. I got my first uh, computer when I went to graduate school. I went to Paris for my doctorate, about 1989. I mean, so I'm hardly someone who has it in my blood and my bones. I had to learn it. And Word on Fire, we have all these wonderful younger people that know how to use all this media. I don't know how to use a lot of them. Uh, but, I'll address younger people in the room, you've got this new media in your blood and in your bones and in your fingers. You grew up with it. You know it intimately, inside and out. Just as Paul used the communication technology of his time, which was writing on parchment and traveling on Roman roads and Roman ships, so you today have to use these new uh, media. Uh, we talked about the Catholicism series, which I'm very proud of. But in some ways, I, I'm even uh, prouder of the videos I've done for YouTube. Uh, 
many years ago now, I got a donation, and the person said, uh, do something creative with this. And at the time, YouTube had just come into being. It was about 2005, 2006. And it was dominated by, you know, silly videos. Like, if my cat jumps off the roof and people would film that, and it would get a million views. So I thought, well, why don't we just try something? Let's try, I'll do some commentary on culture, on movies and music, and we'll see if anybody watches. And we had no idea. I mean, I started making these little videos. And I remember being thrilled the first time one of the videos got like 300 views. I thought, great, I, I made it. You know. But in time, they gained an audience. Gradually, people began uh, watching. And before I knew it, they were all over the world. So I could make a video, we put it up on YouTube, and like that, 24-7, all over the world. Fulton Sheen, the great Catholic evangelist of the last century in America, would have given his right arm to have that kind of communication uh, power. Here's something, too, about YouTube. I'm sure you know it. I only came to know it in time. That you could comment on YouTube videos. Uh, I didn't know that. I thought they just went up and people would watch them. Well, I discovered because 95% of the comments on YouTube videos were negative. People that hated the Catholic Church, they hated the priesthood, they hated me. And so I was getting attacked all the time. And first it kind of shocked me. But I must say, honestly, eventually I came to appreciate it because it meant they were getting outside the church world. It wasn't just church people watching these, it was people in the, in the very secularized world. And I thought, well, good, good. That's the audience I'm looking for. And the second reason I liked it was I was able to get into conversations. I'd answer someone. Here's your question or your objection. Well, here's my answer. And sometimes long conversations ensued. Good, good. There's evangelization, like St. Paul on the Areopagus, remember? in the Acts of the Apostles, when he was dialoguing with the cultural leaders of the time. YouTube was its own kind of Areopagus, it occurred to me. And I love that about it. Here's something else I love. Do you know, you know Bob Dylan here in, in the Philippines? The, he's one of my great heroes. So I did a, a number of videos on Bob Dylan's music and how biblical it was, etc., etc. So we get an email in the office from a young guy and he said, Dear Father Baron, uh, I hated the Catholic Church. I hated the priesthood. But I liked Bob Dylan. And so he was Googling Bob Dylan, and up came one of my videos. And he said, The minute I saw the Roman collar, I wanted to delete you. <laughs> but he said, By some grace, he actually watched it. It led him to a, a couple more Bob Dylan videos I'd done, which led him to many other videos which led him back to our website. And then he said, just wonderful, that he was now entering the RCIA program uh, to become a Catholic. <laughs> not, believe me, not that that's typical. I mean, most people just tell me how much they hate the video. And, but it proves something that Bob Dylan was a kind of seed of the word that I was able to sow. I had no idea who this kid was. I had no idea who watched the video. But that little seed grew. Here's a second one, though. I'm not sure. You know, do you know Charlie Sheen, the actor? Oh, good. Martin Sheen is dead. OK. Uh, so another uh, letter comes in from a young woman. And she said, uh, during the whole controversy with Charlie Sheen a couple years ago, she was looking him up on the internet. and. Up came, um, no, no, she found a website with Charlie Sheen. And that letter to Martin Sheen, right, Charlie's uh, dad, which led her to Fulton Sheen, because, <laughs> you know, it's true, Martin Sheen took his stage name from Fulton Sheen, whom he admired. So Charlie led to um, Martin, who led to Fulton Sheen, and that led her to Catholic preaching, which led her to me. So she then watched the videos, et cetera, et cetera, and then she was now coming back into church. And so my reaction was, well, Lord, if you can use Charlie Sheen to bring people back to the faith, you know, more power to you.
But see, th that's when I talk about the Gutenberg uh, quality, that we have a communication technology that is extraordinary in its power. And Catholics, especially I'd say young Catholics who know it well, have got to find a way to keep using it. So let me just close with um, a repetition of John Paul's uh, line. What's old about the new evangelization? Well, it's what evangelization always is. A declaration of the Lordship of Jesus that brings people from all nations under his headship. We're all here, everyone. We're all here because of evangelization. But what's new about it? I'll repeat them. It's new in ardor. We gotta fight the uh, culture. John Wesley, the great preacher, said, when I preach, I set myself on fire and people come out to watch me burn. Isn't that lovely? That's an evangelical preacher. Ardor, fire, enthusiasm. Jesus Christ has made a personal difference in my life. He set me on fire, and I want to share that with you. Secondly, it's got to be new in expression. Pope Francis here comes into play. The age-old faith, that hasn't changed. The age-old message, the same one that St. Paul preached and Thomas Aquinas preached. But we got to find new expressions to bring it to life today. We have to know the culture today, know people today, know what's in their hearts and minds. New in expression. And finally, the new evangelization is new in method. Use these tools. Use these tools. They're a gift of God's grace. And see, friends, if we do that, we can have the same effect today as Peter and Paul and James and John and Irenaeus and Augustine and Jerome and Bernard and Thomas Aquinas and John Henry Newman and G.K. Chesterton and St. John Paul II. We can have that same transformative power. Set the world on fire. That's what Jesus wanted. And God bless you all. Thanks for listening. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Bishop Robert.